You don't need a college education in order to be a pastor. You don't need a theological degree in order to be a minister of God. Matter of fact, more often than not, you're going to find that even in these latter days in evangelical Christianity, most of a formal education probably is going to work against you in some way. Which isn't to say that there's not a benefit to going to things like Calvary Chapel Bible School or School of Worship or any other thing that God may lead you into. But one of the biggest failures that most denominations, most movements of God, most things that happen within any type of formal, box-like, or even structured type of worship or teaching is that somehow we limit God to what He can do rather than what He will do or He chooses to do. Sometimes throughout the history of the Calvary Chapel movement, I've seen that occur at different occasions, and course corrections were made inside that movement. It was wonderful to see when Chuck would just walk through and say no, yes, and you know things would change. But gradually things developed in different ways, and people made mistakes and people made successes. Sometimes people would even go off on tangents, and they would learn from that. And I'm thankful for the history and the heritage that I've been given by way of my time at Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa and my time with the Calvary Chapel Ministries. I've never been put in the position of being an official Calvary Chapel pastor, but I've been made a missionary at large lots of times by different Calvaries at different occasions. I've worked with different pastors that are a part of the Calvary Chapel movement. And I love that idea that it was the Calvary Chapel movement because that's what it is, the Calvary Chapel movement. But each individual Calvary Chapel has, by way of the Holy Spirit, a differentiation, something different about them that makes them unique and distinctive. There were people when I was growing up that were called Chuckites. They wanted to be like, they followed, and no matter what Chuck said, people did. And they almost worshipped him like an idol. And, you know, we used to smile at them and, you know, comfort them and encourage them. And so finally they would grow out of it, hopefully. Some of them did, maybe some of them didn't. We'll find out. But as we approach the end of the age, as we see time coming to an end, each one of us must stand as a man or a woman. Each one of us must give an accounting for our life unto God, for the good and for the bad. For myself, there are things that I totally would say, oh man, that guy was a shipwreck. And yet Paul, while he was sitting on that island as a shipwreck, soul, unfortunately, for those that thought he was a failure, he went on from there to succeed in the things that God had sent him to do. For what was his purpose wasn't to be caught up in that shipwreck. There he wound up on an island and a snake bit him and it looked like it was all over for Paul. But to come out as miraculous, to come out as a man who was anointed of God, chosen to do those things that God had told him to do. And God went forward with Paul to accomplish much in the kingdom of heaven. You don't need to be a Paul. You don't need to be a Chuck Smith. You don't need to be a Billy Graham, and you sure don't need to be a John MacArthur. You don't need to be a Baptist. You don't need to be a Protestant. You don't need to be a Catholic. You don't need to be a Jew. As a matter of fact, what you need to be is you. You need to be the person that God uses. You need to be the one who is weak, who is feeble need, who has such a trembling before God that you don't know what to do. You're not confident in your own abilities. You don't have the strength to stand up to the wiles and the trickery of the devil and all the ways that manifestations of his ministry goes on at these latter days because you will be deceived. And self-deception is a huge one. But one of the things you can do and that you should do is to trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. I know because I've been directed at times in Calvary Chapel movement at times outside of the Calvary Chapel movement. Always praying for all movements, whether it be the Pentecostals, whether it be the Evangelicals, whether it be the Protestants, whether it be the Catholics, whether it be those that are outside of Christendom. I've been led to pray for all those souls and saints that know Jesus and don't know Jesus. Those that only religiously follow Him and those that follow Him in truth and in spirit. Those that worship Him as best they know how and those that are professional and paid to do so. 
I pray for all of them. I don't always see the accomplishment of my prayers, but I have confidence that whatsoever God has led them to do, God can take care of them to follow through to do that with which they are called to do. For me, God has laid upon me a necessity. It is necessary that I go to do that which God has told me to do. I see it as something I don't want to do, some place I don't want to go, something I don't want to be possibly faithful to God in doing, and yet I go. You see, Jesus said a parable and a, t a story about someone, the man who says yes and never does what God said to do. And each one of us have to wrestle with that because there are lots of times I know in my life I've said yes to God about something early on in my life and then later when God calls me on it, I say no. But there's also times in my life that I know that you're just like me. You'll say no because you know what waits you. Trials, tribulations, struggles, frustrations, aggravations. Those things that are going to cause you to even fall down like Jesus did with his cross. Where you need others to pray for you. You need others to help you. Where you're not strong enough to do the things that God is showing you to do. And word of faith people or not, you know what waits for you. And yet you go. Because you'll say no, but you'll go. And that's one of the things that I find myself in in going to Utah is that I don't want to go. Matter of fact, I want to stay right here where I'm at doing what I do. I want to share Jesus in a personal, intimate way on video. Because it's easier in some ways. It's been a massive struggle spiritually. But in the physical aspect of dealing with a person face to face, on seeing them eye to eye, on talking to them you know, conversationally, and I'm very good at it, don't get me wrong, I've been to Jerusalem. In those aspects of having to lay down your life for other people, and I've done that just recently coming back out of the missionary field and going into Vidigal, that while there is a great beauty to knowing people intimately, there is a great challenge of how much you wear their care, you know, their their feelings, their emotions, their struggles, their trials, their tribulations, how much you die to yourself in order to live for them. And one of the things that I see in that is that, no, I don't want to go. I don't want to go start a ministry up in Utah, possibly in Bountiful, possibly in the home of my wise children to start with as a home Bible study, or even to relocate the ministry of Vidivo into you know the state of Utah, because I know what waits me there. I mean, if we wanted to say where Satan's seat is, it may not be in Utah because there may be a great revival going on in the Mormon church. I don't know. But I know that having been raised with Mormons at one time, I do understand them. And though my wife was previously married to a Mormon and you know her children were you know raised with Mormon doctrine of some type, I know the challenges that face me and I'm aware of. And I don't want to go. You see, I don't want to take with me some of the preconceived bad ideas that I might have, the notions that I might have, the devotions that I might have that might influence me in a negative way towards those people that need Jesus in a positive way. I don't want to take with me you know, any baggage or luggage. I want to be open to something that I was raised on, the very simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ and stating to the everyone that I can meet, Jesus is coming again. That is a fact. In this generation, you will see that Jesus is coming. Because Maranatha was not just a byword and something that we used for the music industry. It was something that we declared from the moment that we were saved. I got saved with the whole aspect of knowing that Jesus was coming. And Moses, Moses, Noah took 400 years in order to prepare the ark. And guess what? He preached every day that he did it. By the demonstration of his life and by the aspect of the realization of knowing that he wasn't saying that there was the eminency of his return. He was planning on it and preparing for it. And that's the thing that I go forward with today. I want to start something that reminds me to go back to where I began, to cling to the roots of what I am, Little Country Church. Because you see, there are things I believe in that I don't see necessarily we're doing. Now the church I go to is doing it in some small part, and if you want to say, why am I so adamant about it, because they remind me of where I come from, and how greater, more so, I want to go so in the direction that they know so. And that is, they have on Wednesday night something interesting that I think is very good, but I want to see more of it done in the body of believers. They have this time of where they, oh, they get together, you know, and they have their, their worship, you know, and then they, they break. They take a break in the middle of worship to fellowship. 
Now, I imagine it probably comes from whatever background or denomination that this church has become a Calvary from. I don't know. It may be some idea that somebody picked up along the way. I don't know. But it reminds me of something that I know of from the black gospel movement, you know, from the way back whens, back in the Southern Baptists or the Baptists or the time when there used to be those, what we used to call Negro spirituals. It used to be called Sunday go to meeting. You know, Sunday go to meeting, when they would go to church and afterwards they would have a picnic. You know, the Sunday picnic. You know, the time when they would fellowship together, and it wasn't called fellowship, it was called, we're eating chicken, honey. And guess what? They sat down and they ate together because they needed to because the society that they lived in formed them into a community that whether it be through persecution or whether it be through poverty they were brought together because they needed to be together they shared in a common meal they shared in food oh yeah they had communion too but they had food they had the reality of there not just being the word of God but being the physical manifestation of the food that God had provided and that's something that I see as a necessity that I want to take with me into the ministry. That as I go forward, I want to start a little country church. I want it to be called Little Country Church. As a matter of fact, I'm still praying about it, but I don't know, you know, never know with the Lord. But I want to say to you, pray for me. Because you see, there are frustrations I see that I would rather do something outside of the church than do it inside the church. Because if the church is so copyrighted itself that I can't use worship, I don't want their worship. If the church is so copyrighted itself that I can't portray freely the Word of God and the worship of God, then I want nothing to do with that type of copyright and that type of insulated legalistic type of perspective within Christendom that I have to worry about those things. Because I won't. You see, I would rather be thrown in jail for having worshipped the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength than to take from this quasi-philosophical morality of supposedly legalizing or making into some type of copyrighted innuendos of saying, oh, well, you know, we got to support the Christian ministry. Pardon the expression, the hell we do. And I won't. So, if you think of me, then pray for me. Because, you see, I wrote all my own original songs at one time, and if I have to pick up a guitar again and do that, I will. There's no problem there because I came from the Jesus movement. I know what we did back then. And then we were putting together songs so that they could be learned and worshipped without having an overhead projector. And if you want to follow me, <laughs> don't come and see something that you're going to be expecting that you were already a part of. You know, all the big screens and everything else going on. No, you get ready to close your eyes and worship the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Because that's the kind of way that I believe it should be. I don't believe in anything that has to do with the technological aspects of reminding ourselves over and over again what the words say. I don't believe in focusing in on the person that's standing on the stage with the bright lights shining in you know, the pulpit, maintaining the prosperity or the popularity of a person that's put up front. I believe in there being more to Jesus than what meets the eye. And that we need to get back to some reality sometimes when we go back to our initial days when we first started in home Bible studies and stay with it all the way up when we get bigger and greater. So you see, I have not really aggravations. There are concerns and situations that I say, others may, I cannot. And so I'm going to be an independent, I've decided. You know, I prayed about this for a long time and I said, you know, I would have loved to have been a Calvary Chapel pastor. You know, that would have been one of the greatest things in all my life. And when at different times, different ministries have said, you know, well, we want to send you, God said no. And I shared with them and said, you know, God, God just told me no, you know, and sure enough, something would come up and confirm it to them, and then, you know, they wouldn't be able to either afford it, or they wouldn't be able to do it, or they would be gone, <laughs> which is always interesting to me. It's like, wow, I'm here and they're gone. Well, what happened to that? <laughs> Good question. But the point being is this. While I am blessed and I rest in the joy that I experience, and I bless every Calvary Chapel pastor out there because they have to go their own road, they have to walk their own walk. They have to talk their own talk. For me, myself, and I, you know, as well as my family, my friends, and those people that are identified in Vidivo that maybe understand some of the things that I go through because I share them with you, I have to be faithful and true to Jesus as he reveals himself to me, as he speaks to me, and as he opens up his word to me. And as I do that going forth into a ministry, you know, as far as being the physical ramifications of it, not just an interstate ministry, but being a home Bible study and eventually a church, then it will be Little Country Church. And it will be predicated upon this. 
first and foremost, Jesus is coming. That's the most important thing that I can preach, teach, and relate to anyone out there. It's not just a byword. It's not just a psi word. It's not just something said once in a while to remind us of the imminency of the return of Jesus Christ. No, as a matter of fact, it's a living aspect that the reality of getting ready for Jesus to come again will be daily taught and reminded. Because it's not just the gospel, but it's the gospel of guess what? Guess who is coming? The words Hosanna means save us now. It doesn't mean save us later. It doesn't mean think about it once in a while. It doesn't mean go about your life and prepare for your children's future. It means get ready. Jesus is coming. Get saved now. Save us now. So the eminency is a doctrine that I'll reject completely because it's not about the eminency. It's about the mandatory reality of something that's going to happen in your lifetime. And that's what's going to be one of the first things that's going to be on what we believe in. We believe that Jesus is coming, and he's coming this soon, this generation, not soon. And it'll probably be worded somehow like that, this soon. Because guess what? Jesus is coming. And the second aspect that I think is most important to bring out is the reality of the Word of God being personal and real. Not just simply this idea that Jesus is personal and real, but the Word of God, both as the person and as the written Word that both aspects have to be real, that there has to be a personal relationship where that person is growing and knowing Jesus in a personal, intimate way, and the criteria with which I will present in teaching and sharing and relating the Word of God will be to get to know people to know if they know Jesus. Because I feel accountable for every person that's listening to my voice and speaking the name of the Lord our God without shame, but rather being challenged where they're at daily to have a real genuine relationship with God or don't. And so I'm not trying to beat anyone up because I want them to know the grace and the love and the mercy that I've enjoyed. But I want them to experience the real love that we had in the Jesus movement. I want them to experience the real Jesus that we had in the Jesus movement. Not just some worship experience that they can get anywhere, anytime, any place. But I want them to be able to stop where they are in their job and look up and see the face of God. I want them to be able to close their eyes and worship with a heart that just suddenly springs forth in song. I want there to be that inspiration and not just the exaltation of what was, but what is and what is to come. And that's Jesus. So we will be pushing pretty hard on discipleship as far as what some people would call discipleship, but what I call relationship. You see, I don't think discipleship is something that's outside a relationship. I think it's the automatic response of two people that care about each other. Because, you see, when you communicate, you have discipleship. When you relate, you are involved in a person's life. When you care, you're willing to go that extra mile and live there with that person. So I'm talking about a living church. And I'm going to talk about a living way. And I'm going to talk about the way. Because I don't think that we're doing it quite the way that I want to. You see, I want to get real. I want to get personal. I want to get intimate. And if that means I have to sacrifice the thousands for the few, that's what I want to do. Now, I'll admit, hey, I'm recording this, and there are probably thousands out there that might see it, you know, judging on Video Goes Ministry, probably a lot more. But I'm not saying that you should do what I do. I'm saying you should do what God tells you to do. You should follow the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but be open and yielded to what the Spirit of God gives you ears to hear what He's saying to you, maybe in this message, and eyes to see what God may be leading you into in what you may do. You may be a Calvary Chapel pastor, God bless you, you know. Continue on in that with which God has done, and be faithful to the end of what God has led you in, because that's what God is going to call upon you as we see possibly Chuck Smith leaving soon. Okay, no possibly. As we see Chuck Smith leaving soon. As we see that movement has changed and will change and will morph into something else, be faithful unto the end to God, not to the movement. Be faithful unto Jesus and what he's doing. Seek to follow and to do what God tells you to do all the days of your life and you will see that God will bless you in everything you do, whether it be in the numbers or in your personal relationship or in the manifestation of something else that is unique and distinctive for you. But don't forsake Jesus for the sake of your ministry. Don't forsake anything else, even your family. I mean, don't forsake Jesus for the sake of your family or anything else. Don't lose sight of what you are and who you are in the Lord. 
You are His child. And you'll always be His son. And you'll always be His daughter. So do that which God leads you to do. Even as I'm going forward and I'm going to be greatly challenged and may fall flat on my face, which isn't unusual. But in this place and in this time, as I see it called today and as I enjoy it the way that God has inspired me, I must yield myself to the move of the Spirit. I must be about the Lord's business. I must do those things that as the Spirit moves and as God tells me to go, I go. For that with which is born of the Spirit is spirit, and that which is born of the flesh is the flesh. They that are born of the Spirit, the wind bloweth whither it will, you neither know where it's coming from nor where it's going. So too is everyone led by the Spirit of God. And I must let go of that which is inside me so that other people may know that with which they can possibly experience when it comes to the reality of knowing Jesus in a personal and intimate way and having a relationship with God our Father. Because if I stifle myself anymore, I'll explode. I will self-destruct and destruct in the sense of the reality of stepping back rather than stepping forward into the light. I'll step back into the pews and sit there and be less than what God intended me to be. But necessity is laid upon me that I go. Necessity of the Spirit of God compelling me lest I die and perish within the only realization that I have that keeps me sane and safe every day of my life, and that is my personal relationship with God. And for the sake of myself as well as for the sake of those that await me, I go. And Jesus said, it is better that I go when he talked to his disciples, that I may go and prepare a place for you, that where I am, you may be also. That if I go, it is better for you because I will send you the Comforter. I will send you the Holy Spirit. And you know, I see that too in some ways. Not that I can send the Holy Spirit or that anything else will accomplish in the same way that Jesus did. But I know that it's better that I go. For if I do go, it's best for those that are going to receive that with which I can share maybe and be there for them when they have need. Because except that you seek out to do that which God has shown you, You'll never know faith, really, but you will be living your life on maybe the belief system that you're in. And I pray that that doesn't be, you know, you're stuck in a belief system where you think that just because you've worshipped in some way, or you've been to some worship conference, that's the only way. Because sadly, I see in a lot of those things, you know, especially with the copyrights, failure big time. Or that, you know, you think that just because they do it that way at Calvary, you have to do it that way every day. I don't think so. I've been to a lot of different ministries and a lot of different churches, and I see them just as blessed and just as going forward on fire with the Lord as I do at Calvary. Now, am I against, you know, Calvary's? Heck no. <laughs> I'm blessed out of my mind. I would sit down and I would take a back seat to the ministry I'm in even, you know, to just sit there and enjoy it and to just be blessed and rest, you know, in the place where God has placed me today, you know, and as I'm getting ready to go to church, you know, and enjoy it for what it is and enjoy it as it is because I like it. I enjoy it. I, I am blessed by it. But, you know, I wasn't given much for God to expect little, but I was given much that God requires more of me that maybe he needs to require of other people. Like I said, others may have big ministries. Others may do other things and seek out great fame and fortune. But for me, you know, I'm looking for a few. I'm looking for a few that maybe God has chosen to save. Maybe only one or two. Maybe just one. Maybe it's just in the name of the Son I go and none would be saved. But if I do go, then I prepare a place for others to come after me that maybe they'll follow in my footsteps or they'll go where I've been. And then they'll touch lives and open up maybe a Calvary Chapel. Who knows? Maybe another ministry. Maybe as a missionary at large when I go to start this home Bible study and then start a ministry, you know, I'll say, hey, you know, Calvary or maybe even the church I'm at, can you send someone? Is there anyone there that feels led to go and become a pastor? And I'll step back and step aside and be an administrator. <laughs> I don't leave things in other people's hands too often. <laughs> a little nervous about that, especially with what I have seen in the learning curve of a lot of pastors. But, you know, I mean, I have no problem with being an administrator, uh, stepping aside and putting someone else in charge as a pastor. Because, you see, each one of us have unique and distinctive gifts that God has given us. 
And we do have all the gifts God has given us, and there is no gift that God will not withhold from us if we ask Him for it. And we can have all the gifts. We may not choose, God may not choose to use them always in our life, but I'll tell you this, in any capacity that you can name, I've done it. And I, I'm just going to sit here and say it that boldly and that bluntly, you know, and somebody may say, what? What an egotist. And I'll say, well, no. You see, when you step up to the plate and you take the bat and you swing and you hit a home run, what do you say? Didn't happen? Sorry. When God chooses to use the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, He'll use anyone, anytime, any place, anywhere that He chooses to. And a missionary at large is that type of person. That missionary that goes out to other countries is that type of person. Any missionary, in other words, any person that got saved when Jesus said, go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, when they've been given that gift of God to go by way of receiving His Holy Spirit, to empower them to do those things that God has told them to do, then you'll find there is nothing they cannot for with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And any man, anywhere, at any time, can be any of the gifts, any of the offices, should God choose to use them in that man's life or that woman's life. <laughs> Although that may challenge some of you in your theology. All I can say is, God knows I've been there, and I've seen some Calvary pastors shocked when they've gone to other countries, sometimes to their core faith values in what God might do in some certain circumstances and situations. So, I wanted to share this because it was a concern of mine. You know, it's a super moon, so to speak, so you know when this happened. It's like in 2013. It's been like, you know, something I'd like to put, you know, kind of a time frame on so that I can play it back and remind myself. This is the way that I choose to go with the Lord. This is the way that God is instructing me to go and to do and to be. This is the way that God wants me to live. To start a ministry, to have that idea of it's not just a Sunday morning service. It is a feel, it is a food service. You know, it is a time of eating. You know, where I even want to go to the point of such extreme measures to say, hey, we're going to meet in a way that we can have food on the table and you eat while someone teaches. You listen and eat food and have conversation while someone teaches. I want it to be about the Word and then the worship. So in other words, I don't need to have the worship set up the Word. No, as a matter of fact, I'll probably have the Word taught first. And afterwards, we'll worship and go out with the joy of the Lord. may be surprised at what God may open up with my ministry or the ministry that He's revealing to me to do in honor of His name so that He can come and visit and see if it's done according to what He chooses to use. Because I know in the letters to the seven churches, there's a lot of warnings and a lot of aspects. But you know what? They had a lot of issues, but they also had a lot of faith. They were faithful to do that with which God had told them to do. And so God had an angel watching over them. I pray you may now ask my angel to watch over me. That you would keep me in your prayers and keep me in your concerns for this ministry of Little Country Church. Because Though the little country church at the edge of town, people coming every day for miles around, preacher isn't talking about religion no more, he just wants to praise the Lord. Guess what? I want to praise the Lord, but I don't want to do it with a copyright on it. I want to share Jesus' is coming, but I don't want to do it with the idea of it being a theological idea, and just a backstop for what I'm supposed to say for those that maybe don't believe it and don't live that way. No, I want to show you how to live it that way. And I want to also declare that, hey, you know what? It's okay to teach the Word of God in topical and in expositional and in integral specificity according to the Word as it's written the way it is, as it is, such as it is. And that if you want to find a literalist, you found him in me. Because I do believe that the Holy Spirit can use the Word of God as a literal aspect of the very physical form of Jesus Christ manifesting Himself in the ears of the person here. And so, beyond that, you got to come and see what I mean. So, praise the Lord. You know, I look forward to dying that He may live, but I look forward to giving that I may receive. Not from monetary gain, for freely we receive, freely give, but I look forward to sharing in the goodness of God in the food, in the fun, in the fellowship, in the return of the Son, 
and in the preparation of the gospel of peace, knowing that, guess what? Not only is Jesus coming, but he's coming so soon that you don't have time to go get a doctorate degree. You don't have time to go get a Bible, theological, whatever, unless God sent you there. If God sent you there, God only knows why you're there. Look for opportunities to share what you're learning, because every day you're meant to use what you've got for that day. Because Jesus said, sufficient is the day and the evil thereof. So pray that God leads you into something today to accomplish for His kingdom so that you'll be in it and not of it. So that you'll be doing for it and not just about it. You see, Jesus every day, because He lived with the disciples, was obviously in the ministry all the days of His life. And that is the attitude, that is the perspective, that is the example that we follow. It's not about Luther. It's not about Peter. It's not about Paul. It's not about anybody else. It's about Jesus. And you see, if I can't live my life like Jesus, freely receiving, freely give, if I have to put copyrights, legalities, you know, all those issues of morality that somehow in a philosophical way of point of view, you could say that maybe I'm in rebellion or maybe I'm in complete legality because I'm operating according to not taking those things that do have the copyright on them, but rather creating the inspiration and the integrity of what God is doing at the moment to share with those that care enough to say, hey, I don't care what you may say about taking it off the radio or taking it off of here, there, or anywhere else. We were meant to share Jesus. And if there has to be some kind of like massive amount of, you know, we've got to do this and that and the other thing, then I'm sorry. The Jesus I found isn't the Jesus that I learned from. You know, because I didn't learn these things from Jesus. But I have learned it from church and from the religious system of the world. So I don't know about you. And God bless you if you've got, you know, like the church organization, church manifestation, church doctrine, church legal system, church integrity of receiving monies, the church, you know, nonprofit organization, 301C, whatever, you know, thing that you got to still file for law and all that stuff. No, I don't. You see, I can do something like Paul did. I can go to work. And I can go ahead and pay for everything because God provides. You see, I can go out and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to live where God abides, God provides. I'm not going to be a part of training of some religious way of doing it because I wasn't trained. I'm going to go out and see how stupid I could do it the wrong way and see if God will bless it that way. So pray for me. Because, you know, that looks pretty weird, doesn't it? That sounds pretty stupid. But you know what? If I'm going to go out I'm going to go to those who are very religious, the Mormons. If I'm going to go to a state that is more Christian than Christians, then I'm going to do it the way that I know Jesus said. Because anything less than the reality of God is going to look like just another Mormon to people that have been experiencing that for hundreds of years in that state. God help us if we live our lives in such a way that we are lived less like Christians and more like religious zealots. God help us if we don't just live out the faith that we believe in, in our home as well as in our church, in our life as well as in the pulpit. And I don't mean the aspect, and let's get real for a minute, I don't mean the reality of saying to you, hey, you know, you need to walk the talk and walk the walk, you know. No, I mean the reality of knowing you're a sinner. You're going to screw up. You're going to blow it. You're going to fail. You need to be a pastor who can say, yes, I sin, and I ask God's forgiveness, and God forgives me, and be tender. Yes, I am a person who says, hey, you know what, there's a structure, but you know, we don't care about the time. If you got to get up and go, go. If you got to stay, stay. Whether you go or whether you stay, the Lord lead us today. And so I want to leave it up to not the, just the Spirit of God, but I want to leave it up to the Word of God. I want to leave it up to Jesus Himself. Maybe 
maybe leading one person that maybe others can do, you know, the religious thing and can do the Calvary thing and can do all these other things. But I've seen something that I don't feel comfortable with. That I have to say to myself, God, though you slay me, I'm going that way. I'm going to follow you today. I'm going to start this ministry. We're going to call to begin with Little Country Church and see what you might do. And who knows, Lord? Maybe it might be a retro. Maybe it might be something that, you know, if we hadn't had some of the structure and some of the things happen to us, maybe we'd still be that way today. And maybe we're not supposed to be that way today. Maybe others are supposed to be who they are and what they are, and God bless them. And I'll support them. You know, don't get me wrong. I support the movement in Calvary Chapel. I support a lot of different movements in a lot of different churches and a lot of different aspects of the body of Christ as God has given them wisdom and knowledge according to their direction. But just like that poem says, if you look it up, others may, I cannot. So though there only be a few, maybe one or two even, Little country church. Here I come to worship the Son. To declare to the world Jesus is coming again. To say to each individual person, trust in the Lord with all your heart. To share and to relate Jesus in a personal way that they'll be able to say, yes, he who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son of God has not life. And I'm seeking to know the Son and to hear his voice. So God help us. I hope we don't get deceived by ourselves. So I ask you once again, as I've asked you more than twice, pray for me. Pray for this ministry. Pray for Vivo, yes. Pray for all those things, yes. But pray for me. Pray for this ministry that's going to a place I don't want to go, to a thing I don't want to do. Pray for Little Country Church.